Well, good morning, church. It's wonderful to gather with you all this morning to worship our risen Lord. Just a few announcements this morning. We do have a fellowship meal at the park immediately following service today, and that's what we call picnic style, which means you bring your own stuff. So um, I guess you can still bring a crock pot, but that would just be for you. Uh, but, but even if you didn't know about that, we would encourage you to come. The, the address is in the bulletin. So it's just a park right around the corner for here. And uh, you, you just come and, and, and fellowship and, and enjoy each other in the Lord. Um, the men's meeting for June, we're going to be covering uh, the book that we've been talking about for the last couple of months, but have just been providentially hindered from getting to. So we're going to be talking about how men should lead their families. So if you haven't got it, there's still a few books back there. It's 29 pages. And so there's not a man that can actually understand my voice that has an excuse not to read this. Um, and so I want to encourage you all to get it, read it, meditate upon it, and let's come and, and exhort and encourage each other as we talk about that. It's an extremely important issue that is much neglected in our society and even in the church today, the fact that men actually have a calling to be the leaders in their home and be the prophet, priest, and king to their family. Like Those, those are radical um, statements, but I think biblical statements that we need um, we need to be encouraged in and be equipped into what, what does it look like to live that out. And then for the month of July and probably August, we're going to be going through um, Joe Boot's new book, Ruler of Kings. Um, and the subtitle is, it's toward a Christian vision of government. And so I think with everything that we've seen in our nation around the world over the last year or two, this is a very timely book for us to be able to begin to, to maybe further think through biblically uh, what, what, a, what a Christian view of government is. And so this is a little bit longer book. It's about 200 pages. And so I know some of you men might not have time to do this, but I want to encourage you to grab one if you have time. And if you grab one, just think about your covenanting with me that you're actually going to read this. But I think, I think you will be blessed by it. I think you will enjoy it. So I, I do encourage you to grab one uh, and, and work on over the next couple of months reading it. We're going to do the men's meeting on the second Sunday or second Saturday in June instead of the third, just because there's a conflict with some of the ladies. And so we're going to do the ladies study on the third Saturday instead of which normally the second. And so the ladies will be continuing in um, the, the Martha Peace, Peace book, um, Damsels in Distress. So if you, if you are a lady and don't know about that, talk to my wife um, after service, and, and I think that would be a big blessing for you to be able to participate in that. Then we are having baptisms sometime in the next month or two. We're going to work on scheduling that. But if you or one of your children are interested in coming for baptism, please um, get with me um, quickly about that just so we can get you on that schedule. And, and Lord willing, sometime in the next few weeks, we're actually going to do a, a baptism class for those um, that are interested in coming. So that's all I have in relation to announcements. So for our time of confession um, and, and prayer this morning, we've been going through the, the Ten Commandments, and now we make our way um, to the Eighth Commandment, so we're kind of hitting the home stretch here. And I, I just want to remind us that any time we come to any of the commandments of God, they have to be seen in the context of the indicatives of, of Scripture, who you are in Christ. And so as we're going to talk about the Eighth Commandment, do not steal. It's not a, oh, to be pleasing to God, don't do these things or do these things. What it, what it means is it's because you have been born again, you've been given a new heart, that you actually now desire to want to live these things out, that you are actually a good tree, and part of what it means to bear good fruit is to not steal from your neighbor. And so we can't miss that connection. When, when we take the, the imperatives, the moral commands of Scripture, and we divorce them from the, the, the redemptive indicatives, who we are in Christ, that's what leads us into moralism and legalism. So we have to be really clear. And so I, I probably don't say that every time, but I try to stress that a lot because it's really, really, really important to, to not do that. And so Exodus 20, verse 15, very simply you shall not steal. So not a lot of ambiguity. Another one of those commandments that's not exactly hard to understand. But saying that, it's a commandment that many, many Christians have a wrong understanding of. In fact, there was a Barna poll where 86% of adults, so not just Christians, but 86% of adults said that they had completely satisfied God's requirement 
regarding an abstinence for stealing. And so, so a majority of adults think that they obeyed this eighth commandment perfectly. And that shows you just what a low view of this commandment that there actually is. And so we tend to think, hey, this is a really great commandment for thieves, but for me, you know, not so much of an application there. But this is another reason why we have a catechism, because our catechism helps us to understand and shape our thinking in these things. I want to look at those, the two catechism questions related to the Eighth Commandment. Question 81 is, what is forbidden in the Eighth Commandment? And the answer, the Eighth Commandment forbids whatever would unjustly withhold or diminish a person's possessions or attainments. So it forbids whatever would unjustly withhold or diminish a person's possessions or attainment. So clearly within that, an, an outright stealing, an outright you know, breaking into someone's house, taking their possessions, that's forbidden. But just, be ha- just because we haven't done that, that doesn't mean that we've obeyed the heart, that we've obeyed the, the underlying moral principle of that command. For example, using unjust weights and measures, something that we see in, in Proverbs as being forbidden, that would be an, an implication of obeying this, this eighth commandment. And in effect, when you're using unjust weights and measures, what you're doing is you're in a transaction, you're trying to get something more than what you justly deserve. And so you, you're manipulating the, the circumstances, manipulating the, the, you know, the weights, the balances used to be able to get more than what God would say that you deserve based on the actual terms in that case. So let me just give a few examples of that. If you're paid hourly, it would be padding your hours on your time card. That would be a form of breaking the Eighth Commandment. If you're paid a salary, it would be taking credit for someone else's work to be able to get that that promotion, get that better job, would be a form of theft. If you're a business owner, not paying your employees a fair wage. If you're an accountant, it could be cooking the books in order to deceive the stockholders and depriving them of their value. If you're a banker, it could be charging excessive interest. If you're a home appraiser, it could be overvaluing a home, which you may think is a good thing. I'm going to overvalue this home to help someone get in this home that otherwise couldn't do that. Well, it sounds like it's, it's altruistic and good, but what you're doing is you're, you're defrauding the bank in that scenario. You're giving them more risk than what the, what the dollar amount of that loan would pay for. Or if you're just coming for an applica- like a loan application, it would be like lying on that, stretching the truth when it, you know, for, a, for a new car, for a new home. It could be lying on your taxes. And I'll, I'll tell you, I believe that a Christian should pay the absolute minimum tax that they rightly owe to the federal government. Like, you should do all you can to minimize that. The the tax system is unjust. The amount is unjust. I agree with all that. But you ought to do that within the legal means given to you. You ought not to, to lie, to deceive in order to pay less tax. That would be a way of breaking the Eighth Commandment. And here's one um, where we've talked about before, you may feel like I've, I've moved from preaching into meddling. Another example would be, let's say if you buy something from a store and they have a certain return policy and you take whatever that is back to the store knowing that you violated that return policy, you're in effect stealing from that person that you bought that from. And so we often tend to don't think in those types of terms because we don't think about what it would be for us, right? Like if we were the store owner, like we would recognize that's a big problem, right? People are buying stuff and they're bringing it back and now I can't resell it and it's costing me money. That's in effect what's happening But because it's a big company. Oftentimes we can tend, you know, to want to overlook that, oh, this is just, you know, just some minor expense for them, but but it's stealing or it could be even pirating online movies or, or music. I mean, taking something that someone else worked for that they should be rightly paid for and thinking that somehow you deserve it free of charge. And so that's prob- that seems like a lot, but I would say that's probably just scratching the surface of how do we actually take this Eighth Commandment and, and, and apply it in the negative sense today. But 
Now what about the positive side? So question 80 of our catechism says, what is required in the Eighth Commandment? The answer, the Eighth Commandment requires that we pursue lawful and useful work to provide for our needs and for those unable to provide for themselves. So we see Paul make this connection in, in Ephesians 4.28, where he quotes the Eighth Commandment. He says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And so not only do you violate the, this Eighth Commandment, it is in the first question, by unjustly or withholding or diminishing a person's possession or attainments, but you actually have to labor to provide for yourself, and not only for yourself, but to provide for the needs of others. And so as Christians, we ought to be the most generous people out there. And we've talked about this before, that we're actually called to save for, for, for our old age, and not just for our old age, we're actually called to save to leave an inheritance to our children's children. And so we don't we often don't think in those terms. We've, we've sort of thought, hey, we, the government does that, right? We pay into Social Security, and, and we're going to get that one day. And if you're my age or younger and you think that that is actually going to happen, you, we may need that talk after service. Um, but, but, but we're called as Christians to, to think through to do those things. Part of the, the positive aspect of not stealing is actually providing for yourself, providing for others. But also, we see in Scripture that we can, in effect, rob God, we preached on this verse several years ago, Malachi 3.8. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and your contributions. And so we can violate the Eighth Commandment by not giving to the church bountifully rather than sparingly, and not giving to the church out of a cheerful heart, but rather doing so reluctantly or under compulsion. And if you want to hear my biblical theology of tithing, you can go back and listen to that sermon. I don't believe that there's a 10% requirement for the church today, but I believe that God has given standards for us in his word that really should exceed that 10% if we're actually doing all those things. But there's not some you know, percentage that we can you know, hold over and say, you must do this or you're in sin. We've been given biblical principles to, to, to sort of guide us in that. And so that's just, I think, a brief summary of both the negative and the, and the positive aspect of that Eighth Commandment. But I hope that it gives you a, a much more full-orbed view as we look at that commandment where you're not going to be one of those 86% of adults that think, oh, man, I've got that down. Like, hey, no problem as far as that goes. And, and again, what we do is we look at this commandment in, in light of the gospel that may God empower us to live righteously, to live out justice, to obey this commandment in order to glorify him and show love to him and love to our neighbors. So let's just take a few moments to pray to to examine our hearts anew in relation to that truth, and then I'll pray for us corporately. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come to you in the name of Christ. We come rejoicing in your word, rejoicing in the gospel, and rejoicing in your commandments. Or we come confessing that, that our tendency is to minimize what you've called us to. Lord, as we look at this eighth commandment that you shall not steal, Lord, I think too often we're like that 86% of American adults that think, hey, this is not a problem for us, that we've got this down. But, but as we open up the totality of your word, that we see where the principles, the, the callings that you've given us, where we see that where we've fallen um, far short of the standard that you've given us. So Lord, I pray that, that where repentance is needed, that you would grant that, Lord. I pray that you would help us to not just be a people that, that doesn't steal from our neighbor, but one that what, what works, gives generously, saves, Lord, and, and gives generously to the church and, and to ministry, Lord. And I pray that all those things, we wouldn't be looking um, to, to ourselves, to our good, to our glory, but we would be looking to Christ. We would be looking to advance his kingdom in this world and to seek his glory. I pray, Lord, where we've fallen short, that we would 
see the hope that's found in the promises of the gospel, Lord, that in Christ there is no condemnation, so that even though we come confessing today, we can come rejoicing that we've been reconciled to you, a thrice holy God, through the shed blood and righteousness of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would work through our time of worship together today. Lord, I pray that you would Lord, convict those that sit here apart from you, that they would see, Lord, as your word is opened, and, and specifically as we look at that what is true of Christians, Lord, that they will not continue in sin, that maybe there's people here today that confess your name, but live a, a lifestyle of rebellion against you, Lord. I pray that you would reveal that to them, that you would remove the scales from their eyes, and that today would be the day of salvation, that you would, you would bring them to Christ today. Lord, I pray for those of us in him, Lord, that this would build us up in the faith that we would be made more into the image of Christ. Lord, I pray all this in his name. Amen. If you'll stand with me as we recite our scripture memory verse from this morning, which is Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. So my son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. Amen. Brother Jonathan is coming, going to come and do our scripture reading and catechism this morning. All right. Uh, let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 51. We will be reading there, but before we read there, let's do our catechism question and answer. Question, what is the duty which God requires of man? Answer, church. The duty which God requires of man is the obedience that comes from faith. Psalm 51. Hear the word of the Lord. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are, of, are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on the altar. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Come to worship the Lord today. Starting with Psalm 2 in the Psalter app. The word will, words will be on the screen as well. Why rage the heathen and vain things? Why do the people mind? Kings of the earth do set themselves, and princes are combined to plot against the Lord and his anointed, saying thus, let us 
us asunder, break their bands, and cast their cords from us. He that in heaven sits shall laugh, the Lord shall scorn them all. Then shall he speak to them in wrath, in rage he vex them shall. Yet notwithstanding I have him to be my king appointed, and over on my holy hill I have him king anointed. The sure decree I will declare, the Lord hath said to me, Thou art my only Son this day, I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and for heritage, the heathen I will thine. And for possession I to thee will give earth's utmost line. Thou shalt as with a weighty rod of iron break them shall, and as a potter sure thou shalt them dash in pieces small. Now therefore, kings, be wise, be taught, ye judges of the earth. Serve God in fear, and see that he join trembling with your mirth. Kiss ye the sun, lest in his eye ye perish from the way. If once his wrath began to burn, lest all that on him sway. Amen. Two congregational requests. 291. I'm not, not comfortable, comfortable with this one. I do know it, but not well enough. 271. O sacred head now wounded. You want to start this, brother? You want to start this one? You can just start it there and I'll continue. I know it, but... O sacred head now wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded, with thorns thine only crown. How pale thou art with anguish, with sore abuse and scorn. How does that visage languish, which once was bright as morn? What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Savior, 
Tis I deserve thy place. Look on me with thy favor, assist me with thy grace. My burden in thy passion, Lord, thou hast borne for me. For it was my transgression which brought this woe on thee. I cast me down before thee, wrath were my rightful lot. Have mercy, I implore thee, Redeemer, spurn me not. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end. Oh, make me thine forever, and should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love to Thee. What Thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but Thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Savior, tis I deserve Thy place. Look on me with thy favor, assist me with thy grace. Brother Joe? 176. Be thou my vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou First in my heart, I, King of heaven, my treasure thou art. I, King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler. 
Amen. What are we putting our eyes in front of? What is our vision? And it's really an issue of the mind and the thoughts. When we're thinking on the things that are above, our vision is on Christ. But when we're thinking about the worries and the troubles of this world, or we're focusing on the sin, our vision is not on Christ. And how are we to run forward when our vision and our gaze is not on Christ? We need to think and meditate upon the Word of God that He might be our vision. 391, come ye sinners, poor and needy. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome God's free bounty, glorify. True belief and true repentance, every grace that brings you nigh. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Lo, the incarnate God ascended, pleads the merit of his blood. Venture on him, venture wholly, let no other trust in truth. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are ten thousand charms. Heavenly Father, thank you that you do not turn away the sinner who repents and turns to you, that you embrace him. Lord, I pray that you would do a work today to save the lost, to reconcile men and women to yourself today who are enemies of God. That you would advance your kingdom through the proclamation of your word, that you would be with Brother Corey, that every word that proceeds from his mouth would be from your word, Lord, in accordance with your word, through the power of the Spirit, that you would guard his mind and his lips. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, church. It is a blessing to be with you all again this Lord's Day, and it's a joy to worship with you guys. Um, I know that this word is said a lot, but I truly am grateful, and I love this church. I love y'all. I'm thankful for y'all. This morning I was just meditating upon the past 10 years of my life and just what grace life has been to me. How the Lord's used it as a, a glorious means of grace in my life to bring me to Christ, but to mature me in the faith, to keep me from going down corrupt and wicked paths that I shouldn't go. He's put mature men in my life to lead me. And He's given me some of the best friendships that I've had in my entire life. And so, it's a joy to be with y'all, church. And I hope y'all feel the same towards each other. So this morning, we'll be continuing through the book of 1 John. We'll be in chapter 3, and we'll be focusing on verses 4 through 9. And so, if you have your Bibles, turn there. Turn to 1 John chapter 3, and we'll be again looking at verses 4 through 9. In this portion of John's letter, it's obvious what the main subject is it's sin. In verses 4 through 9, John speaks of sin 10 times. And so this morning, we'll be spending some of our time on the subject of sin. And then we will spend some time looking at the relationship between the Christian and sin. What comes to your mind, Christian, when you think of sin? How might you answer this question this morning? What is sin? Does the Bible give us a clear definition of what sin is? And what is the relationship between us as Christians to sin? Another thing I hope that you'll examine yourself and look at is this. Have you minimized the seriousness of sin in your own life? Have you taken doctrines such as grace justification, and have you abused them? Are they glorious, liberating, Christ-exalting doctrines in your life? Or to you, have they become merely a license to sin? Church, may God take hold of our hearts this morning and help us view sin for what it really is. And we need His help. We do. You need His help to see rightly this morning. So please listen as I read our passage this morning. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4-9. through 9. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that He appeared in order to take away sins. And in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen Him or known Him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Church, let's pray. Heavenly Father, We come to You in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. I come to You, Lord, weak myself. Lord, beset with sin myself, in need 
of your truth, God, from your word, in need of your grace, Father, and your mercy. Holy Spirit, in need of your help to see sin rightly and to see what Christ has done for us. God, what He has purchased for us. Oh, help us to see this morning, Lord. God, so that we might serve You. Lord, so that we might not be led away and enticed by deceitful desires away from Christ. Lord, keep us from straying away, Father. Lord, help us to be sober-minded, to be alert. We do have an adversary, and sin is crouching at the door. It's a desire to have us, to rule over us. Lord, make us a people that take Your Word serious. A sober-minded people, please. God, bless the preaching of Your Word this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. So what is sin? What is it? In today's culture, this word sin is not a popular term. Some would define sin as something that is fluid based upon the individual's preference. Sin is something that's merely subjective. What is sin for you is not necessarily sin for me. It's fluid in the sense that morality is not something that's set in place. It's not objectively defined, and therefore it's not unchanging. It's not universally true always. To much of our culture, there is no such thing as good and evil. So what is sin? They would have a hard time defining it. Even many churches in America would minimize the definition of sin. I was listening to a very popular evangelical teacher just to get a clue of what he might define it as. And although he said some really good things, ultimately this is what I got from him. He says, sin is the opposite of God. And since sin is good, or since God is good, excuse me, sin therefore is bad or evil. They would merely describe sin as the absence of God. And as clever as that may sound, I think it minimizes what sin actually is. According to one popular church resource, the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary, they say there is no formal definition of sin given in the Bible. This is a popular resource. But is that true? Well, we know that's not true because the Bible indeed has much to say about sin. And from our text this morning, we are given a very clear definition of what sin is. It couldn't get any more clear. Verse 4, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. From the Apostle John, From the Apostle John, we receive a clear definition of what sin is. Again, sin is lawlessness. Sin is the direct violation of God's divine law. This word sin in the Old Testament is translated from a Hebrew word, hatah. It is an archery term. My mic went off. It is an archery term. And it means to miss the mark. It describes the idea that there is a target, and in an attempt to reach it, we miss the mark. We fall short of it. The mark is the conformity to the perfect image of God. And every time we sin, we are falling short of the glory of God, as is written in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But is this all that the Bible tells us about sin? When John gives us this definition of sin from our passage this morning, John calls it lawlessness. 
When someone is making a practice of sin, according to the text, they are practicing lawlessness. What John is saying is that these people are living as if there is no divine law of God given to men. The word for sinning that John uses in our passage is the Greek word... Excuse me, one second. In great weakness, church. In great weakness. It's what we are. The word for sinning that John uses in verse 4 of 1 John chapter 3 is this Greek word harmatia. And it is a translation of, a, of two Hebrew nouns, hata and hatat, which are related to one another. And it refers to this. This is how the New Testament uses the word sin. It is the act of wrongdoing. It is the moral violation or transgression of God's divine command. In other Bible passages, sin is described as a transgression. To commit a transgression is to rebel against God and to go against Him. It is to breach the contract of the relationship we have as creatures to our Creator. It is to go beyond the limit that God has clearly set in His law. It is to cross that boundary marker and act in direct rebellion against His holy commandments. Sin is the greatest evil in all of the universe because mankind who receives animation, he receives vitality, he receives life from God, disregards Him who is holy in His righteousness and in His goodness, His goodness, and violates His commandments. Sin is much more than me not living up to God's standard and being who God, quote-unquote, created me to be. It is the willful encroachment upon His holy commandments. The generations that preceded us in the church understood this. Here's a definition of sin from the historical church confession, the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. This section is found in chapter 6, section 1, and it's speaking of Adam and Eve's fall in the garden. Listen to how they describe it. Although God created man upright and perfect and gave him a righteous law which had been unto life had he kept it and threatened death upon the breach thereof, yet he did not long abide in this honor. Satan, using the subtlety of the serpent to subdue Eve, then by her seducing Adam, who without any compulsion did willfully transgress the law of their creation and the command given unto them in eating the forbidden fruit which God was pleased according to His wise and holy counsel to permit, having purpose to order it to His own glory. Notice how the confession defines Adam and Eve's sin. It is the willful transgression of the law of their creation and the command given unto them not to take of the fruit that God forbid and eat. They transgressed. They breached. They breached their relationship with God. They violated God's commandment. Notice that there's no ambiguity with the confession's description of what took place in the garden church. It is in subordination to the definition that John gives to us, although John doesn't expound upon his definition here. We can look to other areas of Scripture 
and see the same explanation of sin. And I won't go to all of them, but I'll, I'll stand to one that, that seems to be very clear. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 5-7. through seven. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant, Now I want you to take this understanding, what I've said, and I want you to contrast it. I want you to contrast it with a more modern explanation of sin from a a prominent teacher in the church. A man like Timothy Keller. Here's an article he wrote and published on the Gospel Coalition's website. It's titled, How to Talk Sin in a Postmodern Age. Listen to what he says. Although there is truth in it, there's also something that's very misleading. Scripture, scripture's teaching about idolatry is particularly helpful for evangelism in a postmodern context. The typical way Christians define sin is to say that it is breaking God's law. Properly explained, of course, that's a good and sufficient definition. But the law of God includes both sins of omission and also of commission, and it includes attitudes of the heart as well as behavior in agreement. Those wrong attitudes and motivations are usually inordinate desires, forms of idolatry. Yet when most listeners hear us define sin as breaking God's law, all the emphasis in their minds falls on the negative sins of commission and on the external behaviors rather than attitudes. There are significant reasons in that, quote, law-breaking isn't the best way to first describe sin to postmodern listeners. And I think he makes a caricature of someone who would use that definition. But here's here's his approach. I I ordinarily begin speaking about sin to a young, urban, non-Christian like this. Sin isn't only doing bad things, it's more fundamentally making good things into ultimate things. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, more than on God. Whatever we build our life on will drive us and enslave us. Sin is primarily idolatry. Agree with that last statement, sin is idolatry? Again, he would agree with the definition and say it's sufficient that sin is breaking God's law, but as far as he would use it in evangelism, listen listen to what he goes on to say. I define sin as building your identity, your self-worth, and happiness on anything other than God. Instead of telling them that they're sinning because they're sleeping with their girlfriends or boyfriends, I tell them that they're sinning because they're looking to their careers and romances to save them, to give them everything they should be looking for in God. Such idolatry leads to drivenness, addiction, severe anxiety, obsessiveness, envy of others, and resentment. And you might go, Corey, why are you picking a fight with Tim Keller's definition here? Well, here's the problem that I have with this presentation of sin. One, it places man at the center and it reduces his need for Christ to nothing more than just another hobby or philosophical approach to life that makes man's happiness, his fulfillment and freedom the chief end. And I'll get to what I mean by that. It it sounds more like Tim Keller's been influenced by postmodern thinking thinking than he has influenced a postmodern culture. Listen to what Christ said about those religious hypocrites in Matthew 7. Speaking of the many that will come to Him on that day, He says this, "...not everyone who says to Me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of My Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to Me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in Your name, and cast out demons in Your name, and do many mighty works in Your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from Me, you workers of lawlessness." Although it is true that idolatry is sin, and that in sin we can make a God out of other things besides the one true God. However, if I leave out what the Bible teaches about sin being a transgression of divine law, the culture is going to have a hard time understanding that he stands guilty before God as a lawbreaker. He won't understand the reason why Christ died upon that cross. 
And he won't understand the importance of Christ fulfilling the law on his behalf. Again, the Gospel is more than the cherry on top of your already semi-good life. It is more than spiritual wholeness. It is more than personal happiness and fulfillment. It is the proclamation that God in His great love and mercy sent His own Son to die in my place as my substitute for my sins against a good and holy God. And Christ obeyed the law of God perfectly on my behalf. The perfect law keeper crushed upon that tree, bearing the curse due to those who broke God's law. The righteous for the unrighteous. Therefore, as a church, we must stand upon the Scriptures alone when it comes to defining things such as sin. Even if it it doesn't indulge the man-centered appetite of a secular, humanistic, postmodern culture around us, let God be true and every man a liar, church. Listen to Paul. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. You see, now that we've defined what sin is, we can move on to the second theme in this portion of John's letter. What is the Christian's relationship to sin? Because John is writing this letter to Christians. In verses 4 and 6, John tells us that whoever makes a practice of sin practices lawlessness, and that no one who abides in Him keeps on sinning. That whoever keeps on sinning has neither seen him nor known him. What exactly is John trying to teach his listeners here? Is John teaching the doctrine of sinless perfectionism before the resurrection? There's many cults that would go to a passage like this to promote their false doctrine. Absolutely not. And we know that from previous sermons that I've preached when we've looked at earlier portions of John's letter, such as chapter 1, where we're told this, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That if we say we have not sinned, we make Him, Christ, a liar, and His Word is not in us. In fact, John encourages us to confess our sins because He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In chapter 2, we are encouraged that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the propitiation for our sins. The payment for our sins. So, from the larger context of what John has written in this letter, we know that he would utterly reject a false doctrine of sinless perfectionism for the believer on this side of eternity. He would reject it. He would say that man is a liar. That man is self-deceived. John is not teaching that Christians never sin. But rather, the Christian is not someone whose character is defined by a sinful lifestyle, but rather one of righteousness. A Christian is not a slave to sin, to put it simply. We see this from the final verse in chapter 2 when John writes, if you know that He is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. And in verse 7 of our passage this morning, listen, he says this, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as He is is righteous. The Christian is not someone who persists in sin. And when he does sin, he does not carry on in that sin. Especially when God reveals his sin to him. As we saw from the Scripture reading this morning, in Psalm 51, we are given an open window into the chambers of King David's heart, church after God mercifully revealed his sin to him through the prophet Nathan. David repented with a broken and contrite heart and acknowledged that he had sinned against God alone. 
David pleaded for God's mercy and that God would blot out his iniquities. He didn't just justify himself before God, but confessed his guilt before God. It wasn't simply, God, I'm empty. Make me whole again. No, David knew he had violated against the very author of life, the Creator of the universe. And he knew he was guilty. He knew that God alone was the only one who could wash away his sins and create a clean and pure heart within him. And he prays for that. Again, he didn't persist in his sin and continue a thousand times over in the sin he had committed with Bathsheba. No, when the Lord confronted David, finally he repented. He repented and he ran to God for forgiveness, salvation, and renewal. His hope was in God alone and not himself. Christian, what insight! What instruction is given to us here if we ever find ourselves caught up in the same place as King David? You are to flee, but not away from Christ, but to run to Christ, the only One who can cleanse you of your sins. The Bible says He abounds in steadfast love and mercy, willing to forgive us of our greatest transgressions that we have committed against Him. But notice David's desire from the psalm. Notice it. It wasn't merely enough for David just to feel the guilt of his sin, the weight of it. He doesn't stop there. There's something else taking place inside of his heart when he's confronted with his sin. He wants a clean heart in a right spirit. It's not sufficient for David that he would simply just feel guilt alone. But he seeks restoration with God. Renewal. Revitalization. Regeneration. Repentance is not only my admission of my guilt, but is the pursuit of God's righteousness, church. The man who lives in habitual sin and tries to serve Christ is a living contradiction. He is antagonistic or in opposition towards the Son of God. John would call him a deceived person. John bases this upon three truths that we find in the text. Two are found in verse 5. The first being that Jesus is without sin and that He appeared to take away sins. And in verse 8, He gives us the third reason, that He appeared to destroy the works of the devil. Let's look at these three realities briefly. We're not going to look at them in their particular order, but let's look at them. First one, sins taken away or sins eliminated. The first basis that John gives for the incompatibility of the Christian to practice sin is that Christ appeared to take away sin. Christ did this when He offered up Himself as a propitiatory sacrifice on our behalf to God the Father to satisfy His justice and wrath toward the record of our sin debt against Him. But you see, not only did Christ remove the penalty of my sin, but He also destroyed the power of that sin. That sin that had such a hold of our lives, making us slaves by holding us captive to its every demand. I remember my pre-conversion. I remember what those times were like when I was a slave to sin, as much as I didn't want to do it, when sin said go, I was there. I was like a dog on a leash being led around by my sin. I had no power over it. Sin had dominion over me. But church, when Christ came and He set me free from the power, from the bondage of sin, when He set me free, I could say, no, you are not my Master. Christ is my Master, and I'm going to serve God with my life. 
What glorious truths. You remember the old man. Think about them. Some of you remember him. Think back to those days. He was a cesspool of corruption and wickedness and every other vile practice. Again, but when Christ came, He delivered us from sin's penalty and its power, and we were made new. Think of what Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verse 20. He says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Righteousness wasn't even a concern of yours. Righteousness? What is righteousness? That sounds boring. That sounds lame. That doesn't sound like anything I want to pursue. I want sin. In the same chapter in Romans, Paul explains this glorious reality. And I'm just going to read it because I don't even know, I don't even have words better than which Paul put it. Listen to this speaking about the conversion, about being baptized into Christ, united to him in faith. For if we have been united to him, so if you're a Christian, For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life He lives, He lives to God. And here it is. Verse 11. You ready for it? So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So because of this indicative, like Phil spoke of in the time of confession and prayer, of what Christ has done and who we are in Christ, by virtue of faith, listen to the commandment Paul gives now that it's actually possible for me to keep. He says this, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Why? For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Thank the Lord for His grace. Another basis that John gives to us for the Christian not practicing sin is that Christ appeared and He destroyed the works of the devil, the one whom sin originated with, the one who had been sinning from the very beginning, the first one to fall, that ancient serpent, who's been deceiving mankind since the very beginning. Christ indeed is that fulfillment of the prophecy made in Genesis chapter 3 when God promised that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. In Colossians chapter 2, we see this proclamation by Paul to the church in Colossae. He says this, "...and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him." having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. Verse 15, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. And I believe what Paul is speaking of there is demonic rulers and authorities. These spiritual forces of darkness those forces that once held us into bondage. Christ triumphed over them. Their deception, their rule in the hearts of His people, Christ stripped them of their power. Christ's death upon the cross was a devastating blow delivered to the devil and a triumphal victory over Him. So you might say, 
It doesn't seem that way. Look around, brother. Look around. The devil seems to be very powerful. I know what you see, but listen to what you can read in the Scriptures. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. This is after Jesus sent out the 72 to evangelize, to cast out demons, to do the works that He was doing. He says this, "...the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in Your name." And He said to them, "...I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven." Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, add verse 20, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Next, we have Jesus speaking to the crowds in John chapter 12. Preparing them for His crucifixion. He says this, Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to Myself. Maybe you need one more to see that Christ came to destroy the works of the devil, and He was successful in His mission. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, "...since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil." Christ in His death has destroyed the power and rule of the devil. But more personally, Christ has destroyed the power that Satan once had over our lives. When He was our Father, and when we were His children, and like His offspring, we took on the same nature of our Father. He was a liar, and so we were liars. He was corrupt, and so we were corrupt. He was a blasphemer, and so we blaspheme. We were once slaves of sin and Satan, but Christ has freed us. Satan is still present. He is still present. He still is an active enemy of the Christian. He is an enemy of the church. And we are exhorted in Scriptures to be alert, to not be ignorant of his schemes, the Bible says he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Seeking someone to devour, to devour. But he cannot enslave you if you're in Christ. He cannot prevail over you if you would only employ the means of grace that God gives to you. He cannot have victory over you. And we'll see that. So, what are the works of the devil? I mean, the Bible describes him. He's a liar. He's a murderer. He's the tempter. He's the accuser of the brethren. But church, if we remain in Christ, Satan cannot prevail against us as hard as he may try. We prevail over him by submitting to the Lordship of Christ and His Word by faith in which we can, we can extinguish his fiery darts, as the Scriptures would say. We persevere by faith in Christ. We prevail by trusting in God who will not let us be tempted beyond our own ability. You see, not only do you have the temptation of your own fallen flesh, you have the tempter who is constantly seeking to make you fall, to bring reproach upon your witness of Christ. What does God say? If we trust in Him and the sufficiency of His grace, He will not let us be tempted beyond our own ability. Not only will He not let us be tempted, He will provide a way of escape. He will show us how to avoid sin. How to flee. Where to go. We prevail by boasting in our great weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon us. That in His mighty strength, we can stand firm against the devil's schemes and resist him so that he will flee from us. 
We stand firm in Christ, church. Don't take what I'm saying as if Satan can't cause you to fall. Don't take what I'm saying and become boastful in your own strength, in your own might, in your own wisdom, and think that you can stand with carnal weapons, physical weapons, the weapons of the flesh against the spiritual forces of darkness. No, the Lord has not only saved you, but He's given you spiritual weapons so that you can slay dragons, so that you can conquer the enemy of sin for the glory of Christ. Again, the greatest threat that Satan can make to the believer is actually death. And I won't belittle the fear of death, the pain of death, but that's the greatest threat he can make to you is death, if God would allow him and his sovereignty. Think back to Job. I don't have this in my notes, but think back to Job. There's a clear example. Satan is attacking Job by permission of God for God's purposes. But he can't go further than God will permit. Satan will not prevail against us if we remain in Christ. We abide in Him. Again, the greatest threat that Satan can give to the believer is death. And how he held that over your head before you were in Christ. You might not have known Satan was holding it over your head. You might not have even been aware of what Satan was. But you feared death. You were scared of it. You feared it. The unknown. Dying. What's going to happen? Is there a God? Is there condemnation waiting for me? Am I going to a good place or a bad place? However your understanding was at that time. He held death over you. He held the fear of death over our heads. But thanks be to God who in Christ Jesus gives us the victory over death where we proclaim, O death, where is your sting? Where is it? In Christ, we don't fear death. We see death as a doorway into eternal life. Something that's not a bad thing for the Christian, but it's merely the next step. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, death, where is it? The third reason. And I want to say take heart, dear brother, dear sister, because what does the Scripture say? That He who is in you right now, abiding within you through faith, by the Spirit, is greater than He who is in the world. There is no sin or temptation that has overtaken you that is not common to man. You are not without hope. You are not without hope. You can overcome sin through Jesus Christ. Have you seen what He's done so far? Leads us to the final basis that John gives in this portion for Christians not making a practice of sin. They cannot sin because God's seed abides within them. And I believe that the seed is Christ dwelling in the heart of the believer through the Spirit. I believe it's Christ within the believer. And it is this seed of Christ that is planted in the believer's heart that grows up into eternal life. He cannot continue in sin because it contradicts his very nature, who he is. Although sin is still present in our fallen bodies and it's always seeking to gain a foothold, to gain dominance over us through our members, remember it no longer has power over us to make us obey its passions. If you ever find yourself at a place to where this is just who I am, I can't overcome, you're believing the lie and not the truth of Scriptures. Sin has no power over you, Christian. It cannot make you obey its passions. We've become new creations. The old man who was a slave to sin has passed away and the new man has come. And it's only by slavery to Christ can someone experience true freedom. What a paradigm. In order to become truly free, I must become the slave 
of Christ. The seed of God is like that mustard seed or that leaven in a lump of dough. On a macro level from the parables, it's the growth of the church upon the earth. But I think about it on a micro level. It's the life of Christ and the believer being manifested through the fruit of righteousness which is becoming greater and greater and more and more visible in His life. It is like a mustard seed that is small and it grows up. It becomes more and more obvious that this one belongs to Christ. Righteousness becomes greater and greater revealed in His life. It is the seed of God's truth that has taken up residence in the heart, transformed into good soil by the Spirit, which now can bear fruit thirty, forty, a hundredfold. That's a lot of fruit, church. That's a lot of fruit. I want to close with some application, encouragement, and warnings. In closing, we see that sin is much more than me failing to be who God made me to be. And the reason I say that is because I've believed that in the past. It was just me not living up to God's quote-unquote purpose for me. Just when I think of falling short, I'm just missing the standard of who God made me to be. That's true, but is that all sin is? No, it's, it's more than me just not having a satisfied and fulfilling life. What is it? Again, it's the direct violation of God's law. The transgression of His holy commandment. It is the greatest act of rebellion in the entire universe. And it is a contradiction for the Christian to practice sin because the Christian is someone who has Christ abiding with him through the Holy Spirit. Our Savior who took away our sins by canceling our sin debt that stood against us. Remember, not only did Christ remove the penalty of sin, in His death, He destroyed the power of sin, which He triumphed over the devil, church. Triumphed over sin. He freed us. He freed us. And praise God for liberty, for freedom in Christ. So Christian, where do you find yourself this morning? With your relationship to sin. Your relationship to Christ. What does it mean to practice sin? What does it mean to practice sin? What does it mean to practice righteousness? I would say to practice sin, it just simply means to make sin a continual pattern in your life. It becomes a habit. Something that you're seeking after, pursuing, growing in. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. What is your relationship to the sin in your life this morning? Is it something that convicts you? Is it something to be ashamed of? Something that drives you to God like David to where you cry out to Him for mercy, for forgiveness, to be cleansed? Or is it something like a pet to be coddled, to be hidden away, away from the church, away from everyone else? Something that's to be enjoyed. What is it to you? Flee to the only One who can deliver you from sin's power. Flee to Christ this morning. That's my exhortation. There is only victory to be found in the triumphant King Jesus Christ. To the unbeliever here this morning, perhaps God in His great mercy is working upon your heart right now. And I don't know what's going on in your heart, but perhaps you're tired of fooling yourself. You're exhausted, frustrated. You've been pretending to be a Christian for so long, you can't even remember when you started. The problem is, sin still has dominance over you. It's your master if you're telling the truth. You know nothing of victory over sin. You, you've experienced nothing of the Savior who has conquered sin. Nothing of freedom. 
In fact, when you hear these things, they provoke you to anger when you hear them. You're telling me not to sin? You're telling me to just put porn away? You're telling me to just put idolatry away? Yes, in Christ. You get provoked. You get angry. Oh, he, he makes it sound so simple, like it's something that's actually expected of me. Possible. In fact, the harder you try to become a Christian, the worse you become at it. You can't overcome sin's penalty in your life. You can't overcome its power in your life. Not in your own strength. That's too strong of a foe for you. You're much like those Israelites looking at Goliath. You're hiding in fear. You're terrified. You know you can't defeat this foe. Come to the One who can. The One who conquered. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does He say? I will not cast you away, but I will give you new life if you seek Him. If you seek Him, you will find Him. And the last person I want to speak to, you might be in this room, the Lord knows. You're indifferent to everything that you've heard this morning. From Phil's exhortation to this sermon. You could care less. You're just here because that's where you got to be right now. You have no concern for sin in your life. In fact, you don't think sin's a burden at all. You hear David and you know nothing of that. Sin's actually a wonderful thing to be pursued. You would, love, you would have loved to have been in David's situation. You chase after sin. In fact, if you're young, when the restraints are thrown off, the mercies of your parents, God's common grace in your life, you've already got your life planned out. You're going to chase after sin. You're going to have your fill of the adulterous woman. Whatever it is, you're going to pursue it. I'll tell you, you're deceived, friend. You are deceived if you believe that sin will not cost you everything. What's that saying? Sin will take you farther than you ever thought you would want to go and it will keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay? It's true. But what you need to be afraid of, what you need to fear is that Christ will vanquish all remaining sin. What does that mean? That means unrepentant sinners Christ will condemn away from His presence. Workers of lawlessness for all eternity. He will rid this world of sin one day. You'll either die and stand before Him. But either way, He could come back. But either way, you will face Him. You will face Him. Christ will eliminate sin from this world. And so this is a warning to you today. If you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. If you hear it, children, if your parents are pleading with you to know Christ, know Him. Come to Him. Listen to them. Don't presume upon God's kindness. Don't. You're not promised tomorrow. Don't presume. It's a foolish thing to presume upon God's kindness. How many men in history, how many men and women are in hell today who said, I'll get right with God later on. I'll take religion serious. It's too late for them. It's too late. They were presumptuous. Mercy ran out for them. Don't presume upon God's kindness. Know that God's kindness towards you is meant to lead you to repentance. Come to Christ today and be saved. Come to Him today while His mercy still may be found, unbeliever, and receive the forgiveness of your sins. Please come. Let's pray, church. Father, take Your Word. Apply it to the hearts of Your people. In Jesus' name, Amen. Church, you're dismissed.